I'm actually so happy to be in this room because I'm looking around and it's been a long time. I think since the JVP membership meeting, since I can look around and actually see a room of friendly faces and folks that I admire so, so much for all the tireless work that they continue to do as they grow their families and continue the struggle. Um, so I'm going to begin by sharing, I, I guess, stories as we're all sharing stories. In February 2012, a young unarmed boy was fatally gunned down. In this July, a jury acquitted his shooter, citing that he had a right to self-defense. The judgment made little sense. 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was unmanned, save for a bag of Skittles. It's high fructose corn syrup being its most potent ingredient. But the jury agreed that George Zimmerman experienced reasonable fear at the sight of a black child in a hoodie sweatshirt. A reasonable enough fear to use a lethal weapon to fatally shoot this boy. And in this tragedy, we learn that only a select few will have access to a reasonable fear. Only a select few will have the right to kill in the name of self-defense. And we as a society, through pop culture, the legislation of criminal law, the production of scholarly knowledge, and the influence of big money on our elected officials have constructed this condition, the condition of exclusive, uh, of exclusive self-defense and the exclusivity of victimhood. This summer I had the honor of leading, uh, co-leading an interfaith peace builders delegation with Josh Rubner and I see Emily in the room and uh, Mike who, who continue to lead this wonderful effort. But I had the honor of co-leading the IFPB delegation with Josh and we went, met with David Wilder, the head of the Hebron Settlement Council, who is a U.S. born Jewish man from Cleveland. Hebron, for those of you who do not know, is the site of the most extreme forms of tangible violence. The settler movement began to colonize it in 1967 in what they regard explicitly as their homecoming. They are ideologically motivated and more committed to being on the land which they be believe belongs to them by divine decree than they are committed to the idea of Israel. Unlike other settlements that are built on Palestinian hilltops to facilitate the surveillance and control of the Palestinian population, the settler community in Hebron is built in the middle of the city. It forms a donut hole that geographically, socially, and economically fragments the entire city. In response to a question about Baruch Goldstein, the Israeli settler who killed 29 Palestinians as they prayed in the Ibrahimi Mosque in 1994, <coughs> David explained, quote, you can count on one, maybe two hands, the Jews who have used violence that was not in self-defense. Another delegate asked him about the culture of fear within Israeli society. And David, who wore a pistol on his hip, which Josh kept referring to as his Glock, uh, responded, quote, we don't live in a culture of fear. Everywhere we go, we're marked where someone wants to kill us. There are people who still want to wipe us out and we cannot depend on anyone else to protect us. He then proposes that the parents of Palestinian children who throw stones be deported to Lebanon. In contrast, Isa Amro, a Palestinian youth leader of Youth Against Settlements, like all other Palestinians, have a state, does not have an international force, does not have a pistol or a Glock or anyone to protect him. Settlers physically assault, spit on, and expose themselves to Palestinians in Hebron as Israeli soldiers watch on. They intervene only 
when Palestinians move to defend themselves and in those instances arrest the Palestinians. Isa comments, I am, not, I am a nonviolent activist, but I believe in defending myself. The problem is that I cannot. Under military law, Isa explains he is guilty until he can prove otherwise, while all the Israeli settlers are innocent or until they are proven guilty. Isa is not eligible to be a victim. And Isa is not eligible to exercise self-defense. He cannot experience a reasonable fear because he is always a looming threat for his incontrovertible characteristics. Amongst Americans, and certainly those concentrated here in the Beltway, only David's fear is reasonable. And it is in this context that we are working to change U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. In a condition where Palestinian victimhood is not only hard to imagine, but insisting upon it can be considered offensive and even anti-Semitic. During Operation Pillar of Cloud, which is way too kind a name for the eight-day pummeling of Gaza yet again in November 2012, the Washington Post ran an image of Jihad Mashrawi, a BBC journalist who was mourning the death of his 11th month old son, on the front page. Then Israeli ambassador Michael Oren declared that the portrayal of Palestinian suffering was part of Hamas's media strategy against Israel and therefore constitutive of an existential threat to the state. What is so threatening about the photo is its universalization of suffering. In the instance of mourning captured in that photo, not only are Palestinians able to be victims, but in that moment their suffering is equal to that of Israelis. And the proposition, according to Ambassador Oren and others, is no less than an existential threat to the state. And in fact, it's true. There's something to be said for that. It's not an existential threat to the Jewish people, but it could be a threat to the state itself, and specifically to its settler colonial project, a project that aims to establish control over historic Palestine, wherein the Palestinians are subordinated by law, policy, and decree, where they are herded into concentrated areas of land within the West Bank, within Israel itself, and within the largest canton of Gaza, and where even the history of the Palestinian population, just like their presence, is diminished. To be able to continue the settler colonial project, and not accept that human rights atrocities are being committed necessitates that the equality of Palestinians be unimaginable. It's a dehumanization project at its very core. And so achieving a viable peace with justice or justice with peace requires addressing this root issue, challenging Israel's settler colonial project and the dehumanization of Palestinians. Instead, the peace process for the past 20 years has attempted to tolerate this project while creating acceptable living conditions for Palestinians in exceptional geographic areas. And there are two issues here. One is about the potential for two states to successfully remedy an expansive settler colonial project. And if so, what are the conditions necessary for this to succeed? The other is about the role of Oslo and the two-state solution together, because that's what we've been pursuing. And this, we know, has been a dismal failure. And for the sake of time, which I've already taken a lot of, I know, I'll focus on this latter point and maybe have a discussion about that first point in the Q&A. 
But my point is very simple. Even the most ardent supporters of the two-state solution should be vehement opponents of the Oslo peace process. Because Oslo, by pursuing its very terms, has successfully led to the outcome we see in front of us today. It's not a failure to adhere to Oslo. It was because of our adherence to its terms that we are now faced with the conditions where the two-state solution is effectively been torpedoed. Khalid mentioned very critical points about this. The settler population has increased in the intervening 20 years, something from 200,000 in 1993, nearing 600,000 today. The fragmentation between the West Bank and Gaza socially, economically, and politically has been exacerbated in the past 20 years. The PA can't, the Fatah dominated PA can't visit Gaza. Palestinians from Gaza can't visit the West Bank. Palestinians in the West Bank can't visit Gaza. Military Order 1650 makes it a crime and designates those Palestinians who violate this premise as infiltrators in an attempt to create the state for Palestinians they cannot even co be cohesive amongst themselves. The Judaization project in East Jerusalem, which is supposed to be the future capital of the Palestinian state, is now undergoing an intense Judaization project. It's been a, an explicit goal of the 2000 uh, Jerusalem municipal, municipal Master Plan to alter the demographics of 70% Jewish person. sorry, uh, 60% Jewish persons to 40% Palestinians to 70% Jewish to 30% Palestinians by 2020 and they are succeeding masterfully. Consider that the apartheid wall runs 85% of its route throughout the West Bank, not on the Green Line, and it confiscates 13% of that occupied territory. Consider that Israel's settlement expansion program and just settlement even for firing zones which are basically practicing areas shooting areas for soldiers has expanded and entrenched itself in 62 percent of the West Bank 30 percent of that is the Jordan Valley which we never talk about because there aren't a lot of settlers there there's just a multi-million dollar date palm industry there that belongs to settlers meanwhile as a result of that date palm industry, because water has to be uh, diverted from Palestinian use to exclusive uh, Jewish settler use and Israeli use, the Palestinians who live in the Jordan Valley are forced to leave. The population has been diminished. From 1967, 400,000 Palestinians lived in the Jordan Valley. Today, that number is 56,000 and dropping. And unfortunately, these devastating circumstances, as I mentioned, are, do not represent Oslo's failure, but represent adherence to its terms. And I'll mention just a few of those terms. One, international law was not a point of reference. In a situation where there is no parity between two parties, law will serve the weak. And as Khalid mentioned, in this situation, weakness on behalf of Palestinians, or Palestinian weakness, has been institutionalized Law, international law, for all of its faults, I will admit and don't want to stand here and have a debate about how bad international law is, but for all of its faults, is a, creates balance and parity when that inequality exists. The second, it was confined to bilateral negotiations with the U.S. as the sole peace broker. And as Josh eloquently demonstrated here tonight, as well as in his book, that's a losing policy. There is nothing good to come of that approach because the U.S. has been unwilling to actually shift the status of power and when it has been willing, it's been unable to do so because of domestic considerations as was demonstrated after the first call to halt settlement expansion and of course thereafter as well. Third, also prioritized Israeli security above all other considerations. Everything else is conditioned around Israel's feeling of security, which has no exogenous factors 
that actually measure it. And so here we are in this cyclical, non-ending process and forth, and dev most devastatingly, perhaps the Palestinians, as pointed out in Lesson 5 by Khaled, or was it Lesson 4? You tell me. Uh, it neutralized the Palestinian leadership's ability to act as a liberation movement, and instead made them responsible now as a state-building institution and an outgrowth of Israel's occupation regime. Without going into uh, a lot of details about the way that these factors played out, let me just point out some things about Israel, uh, the Palestinian security sector, which is an outgrowth of this occupation regime. Rather than build the capacity to organize the Palestinian population to protest against Israeli occupation, the Palestinian Authority invested nearly one-third of its national budget on the security sector, which is intended to make Israel feel safe. And during Operation Cast Lead, and other very awful misnomer, Lieutenant General Keith Dayton captured this arrangement when he said, quote, the IDF also felt after the first week or so that the Palestinians were there and that they could trust them. As a matter of fact, a good portion of the Israeli army went off to Gaza from the West Bank and think about that for a minute. And the commander was absent for eight days. That shows the kind of trust they were putting in these people now. And General Dayton was describing the trust that the Israeli authorities had in the Palestinian security forces to police the Palestinians and quell their protest. And these Palestinians comprise or constitute 65,000 of the PA's 160,000 employees. That's approximately 40% approximately of the public sector and 30% of the national budget. Consider that in 2012, 11% of the Palestinian national budget was spelt, spent on health and 19.4% was spent on education. And even less is spent on the agricultural sector. I mentioned that in the Jordan Valley, because of the diversion of water, Palestinians have been forcibly displaced. Well, there's no coincidence that in 1993, 28.5% of the Palestinian national budget was spent on supporting for Palestinian farmers. Today, that's dropped to less than 5.8%. In contrast, the security spending has increased to 30%. Resistance need not be uh, absolutely mind-boggling and extraordinary. Resistance could be as simple as spending more on the agricultural sector to aid farmers to actually stay on their land and to cultivate an economy. And in fact, failure to do so has cost the Palestinian economy 110,000 jobs, 110, jobs a year, about 10% of its annual GDP. <coughs> now, what makes this Palestinian Authority unable to shift course and to resist? Simply, not simply, it's complicated, but at the core of it is the fact that this Palestinian Authority exists on a charity economy. There is no national economy to speak of. There is no other way to be able to feed the Palestinian population and to employ them. Why aren't Palestinians revolting against their own corrupt authority? Because 65,000 of them and no alternatives. So let me uh, wrap up. I'm getting the sign. But, oh, maybe I don't, oh, okay. <laughs> I should have kept reading. Um, let me wrap up on an, up on an uplifting note, okay? So, the most that we can expect by continuing in our Oslo framework with the two-state solution, right? Which, and, I, and I was careful to distinguish those. There's Oslo and there's two states, but Oslo and two states is absolutely devastating. And then we can talk about the virtue of, of a, of a uh, one-state solution, right? But what happens in this process is this bifurcation of a human rights program and a political program so that politics becomes supreme and in fact unlike other cases like Bosnia and South Africa and Northern Ireland where human rights 
constitute part of the solution, here human rights are part of the problem because they would Im impede actually achieving a political solution. And so you have this very uh, devastating development that the Palestinians themselves internalize. And if we continue along this path, the most that we can expect is a containment project where Oslo and the two-state solution and negotiations contain the conflict but don't work to resolve it. And so what can we do? The heart of our work is to remedy that condition. Everybody's like, oh my god, what is it? What is it? It's not, unfortunately, I, I, I didn't create something in a chemistry lab. And <laughs> um, but the heart of our work is to insist upon the centrality of rights and to insist upon the inability to achieve a political, viable political solution that doesn't center individual and collective rights. And the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement does that brilliantly. And the only thing we need to be careful as we carry that mantle is to not confuse BDS with the strategy, but to keep in mind it's one tactic in this goal of actually centering rights. And there's other ways to do that. Other tactics include the power of storytelling, as has been told by Palestinian filmmakers like Anne-Marie Jasser, Elias Sleiman, and Hani Asad, by poets like Suhair Hamad and Tahani Salah and Rami Kanazi, by novelists like Susan Abul Hawa and Ibtisam Barakat. It includes the power of disrupting the hegemony of the news cycle, as has been done superbly by the Institute for Middle East Understanding. We saw Layla al Haddad showing us around Gaza on CNN. Thank you, IMEU. Thank you, Layla. Thank you, Anthony. Isn't his name Anthony Burton? Yeah, Anthony. Thanks to the Electronic Intifada. Thanks to Mondawise. Thanks to Al Shabaka. Thanks to Jadalia. A little plug there. <laughs> and countless individuals and organizations who have taken over new social media to tell that story, to disrupt that cycle, to center hum humanness and rights in the context of politics. It's been done by bringing legal cases in third, part, third party national courts as well as the United Nations, by Badil, by al haq by the Center for Constitutional Rights, and others. And all this also, there's been work done to bear influence on the U.S. political establishment, and I think we're probably farthest behind on that one. But the U.S. campaign has worked on each and every single one of these approaches as a national body, and mostly as a result of your work, the work that each of you has done in, as individuals, the work that your organization has done locally. And it's this approach, uh, uh, a non-conventional approach to changing foreign policy, not from the federal government to the local, but from the local to the federal government in ways that mirror the way that the LGBTQ community has similarly done to shift the national tenor on gay rights. And so this weekend represents another opportunity to be able to think of how to make these efforts bigger, better, and smarter. And I'm very honored to be here with you to do just that. Thank you.